Part One of Victory by Lester Del Rey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Part One of Victory by Lester Del Rey. It seemed Earth was a rich and undefended planet in a warring, hating galaxy. Things can be deceptive, though. Children playing can be quite rough. But that ain't war, friend. Section 1 From above came the sound of men singing. Captain Duke O'Neill stopped clipping his heavy black beard to listen. It had been a long time since he'd heard such a sound, longer than the time since he'd last had a bath or seen a woman. It had never been the singing type of war, yet now even the high tenor of old Tiroini, who lay on a pad with neither legs nor arms, was mixed into the chorus. It could only mean one thing. As if to confirm his thoughts, Burke Thompson hobbled past the cabin, stopping just long enough to shout, Duke, we're home! They've sighted me, Loa! Thanks, Duke called after him, but the man was hobbling out of sight, eager to carry the news to others. Fourteen years, Duke thought, as he dragged out his hoarded bottle of water and began shaving. Five since he'd seen Rondo on his last leave. Now the battered old wreck that was left of the flagship was less than an hour from home base, and the two other survivors of the original fleet of eight hundred were limping along behind. Three out of eight hundred. But they'd won. Miloa had her victory. And far away, Earth could rest in unearned safety for a while. Duke grimaced bitterly. It was no time to think of Earth now. He shucked off his patched and filthy clothes and reached for the dress grays he had laid out in advance. At least they were still in good condition, almost unused. He dressed slowly, savoring the luxury of clean clothes. The buttons gave him trouble. His left hand looked and behaved almost like a real one, but in the three years since he got it there had been no chance to handle buttons. Then he mastered the trick and stepped back to study the final results. He didn't look bad. Maybe a little gaunt and in need of a good haircut, but his face hadn't aged as much as he had thought. The worst part was the pasty white where his beard had covered his face. But a few days under me, Loa's son would fix that. Maybe he could spend a month with Rhonda at the beach. He still had most of his share of his salary, nearly a quarter million me in credits. Even if the rumors of inflation were true, that should be enough. He stared at his few possessions, then shrugged and left them. He headed up the officer's lift towards the control room where he could see Miloa swim into view and later see the home port of Cordul as they landed. The pilot and navigator were replacements sent out to bring the old ship home, and their faces showed none of the jubilation of the crew. They nodded at him as he entered, staring toward the screens without expression. Aside from the blueness of their skins and the complete absence of hair, they looked almost human, and Duke had long since stopped thinking of them as anything else. How long? he asked. The pilot shrugged. Half an hour, Captain. We're too low on fuel to wait for clearance, even if control is working. Don't worry. There'll be plenty of time to catch the next ship to Earth. Earth? Duke glowered at him, suspecting a joke, but there was no humor on the blue face. I'm not going back. Then he frowned. What's an Earth ship doing on Miloa? The navigator exchanged a surprised look with the pilot and nodded as if some signal had passed between them. His voice was as devoid of expression as his face. Earth resumed communication with us the day the truce was signed, he answered. He paused, studying Duke. They're giving free passage back to Earth to all Terran veterans, Captain. Nice of them, Duke thought. They were willing to let the men who'd survived come back, just as they hadn't forbidden anyone to go. Very nice. They could keep their world, and all the other coward planets like them. When the humanoid world of Miloa had been attacked by the insectile monsters from Throm, Earth could have ended the invasion in a year, as those with eyes to see had urged her. But she hadn't chosen to do so. Instead, she had stepped back on her high retreat of neutrality and let the Throm aliens do as they liked. It wasn't the first time she'd acted like that, either. With more than half of the inhabited planets occupied by various monsters, it seemed obvious that the humanoid planets had to make a common stand. If Miloa fell, it would be an alien stepping stone that could lead back eventually to Earth itself. And once the monsters realized that Earth was unwilling to fight, 
Her vast resources would no longer scare them. She'd be only a rich plum, ripe for the plucking. When Duke had been one of the first to volunteer for Meloa, he had never realized his home world could refuse to join the battle. He'd believed in Earth and humanity then. He'd waited through all the grim days when it seemed Throm must win, when the absence of replacements proved the communiques from Meloa to be nothing but hopeful lies. But there had been no help. Earth's neutrality remained unshaken. And now, after fourteen years in battle hell, helping to fight off a three-planet system of monsters that might have swarmed against all the humanoid races, Earth was willing to forgive him and take him back to the shame of his birthright. I'm staying, he said flatly, unless you Meloans want to kick me out now. The pilot swung around, dropping a quick hand on his shoulder. Captain, he said, that isn't something to joke about. We won't forget that there would be no Meloa today without men like you. But we can't ask you to stay. Things have changed. Insanely. The news we sent to the fleet was pure propaganda. We guessed that, Duke told him. We knew the Throm ships, and when the dispatches reported all those raids without any getting through, we stopped reading them. How many did penetrate, anyhow? Thirty-one full raids, the navigator said woodenly. Thirty-one in the last four months. Thirty-one? What happened to the home fleet? We broke it up and sent it out for your replacements, the pilot answered dully. It was the only chance we had to win. Duke swallowed the idea slowly. He couldn't picture a planet giving up its last protection for a desperate effort to end the war on purely offensive drive. Three billion people watching the home fleet take off, knowing the skies were open for all the hell that a savage enemy could send. On Earth, the World Senate hadn't permitted the building of one battleship for fear of reprisal. He swung to face the ports, avoiding the expression on the faces of the two Meloans. He'd felt something of the same on his own face when he'd first inspected Throm. But it couldn't be that bad on Meloa. She'd won her hard-earned victory. They were entering the atmosphere now, staggering down on misfiring jets. The whole planet seemed to be covered with a gray-yellow haze that spoke of countless tons of blast dust in the air. From below, Duke heard the men beginning to move toward the big entrance lock, unable to wait for the landing. But they were no longer his responsibility. He'd given up his command before embarking. The ship came down, threatening to tilt every second, and the pilot was sweating and swearing. The haze began to clear as they neared the ground, but the ports were too high for Duke to see anything but the underside of the thick clouds. He stood up and headed for the lift, bracing himself as the ship pitched. Suddenly there was a sickening jar and the blast cut off. The ship groaned and seemed to twist, then was still. It was the worst landing Duke had known, but they were obviously down. A second later he heard the port screech open and the thump of the landing ramp. The singing of the men had picked up into a rough marching beat. Now abruptly it wavered. For a moment a few voices continued and then died away like a record running down. There was a mutter of voices, followed by shouts that must have been the relief officers taking over. Duke was nearly to the port before he heard the slow, doubtful sound of steps moving down the ramp. By the time he reached it, the last of the men was just leaving. He stopped, staring at the great port city of Cordul. Most of the port was gone. Where the hangars and repair docks had been, a crater bored into the earth, still smoking faintly. A lone girder projected above it to mark the former great control building, and a Meloan skeleton was transfixed on it near the top. It shattered to pieces as he looked and began dropping, probably from the delayed tremor of their landing. Even the section their ship stood on was part of the crater, he saw with an earth bulldozer working on it. There was room for no more than ten ships now. Two of the berths were occupied by fat earth ships, sleek and well kept. Three others held the pitted, warped hulks of Meloan battleships. There were no native freighters and no sign of tending equipment or hangars. The pilot had come up behind him, following his gaze. Now the man nodded. That's it, Captain. Most cities are worse. Cordul escaped the blasts until our rocket cannon failed. Got any script on you? At Duke's nod, he pointed. Better exchange it at the booth before the rate gets worse. Take Earth dollars. Our silver's no good. He held out a hand, and Duke shook it. Good luck, Captain, he said, and swung back into the ship. Mercifully, most of Cordul was blanketed by the dust fog.
There was the beginning of a series of monstrous craters where men had begun rebuilding underground the ruined landing field, and a section of what had been the great business district. Now it was only a field of rubble with bits of windowless walls leaning up to a crazy tangle of twisted girders. Only memory could locate where the major streets had been. Over everything lay the green wash of incondite, and the wind carried the smell of a charnel house. There was no sign of the apartment where he and Rhonda had lived. He started down the ramp at last, seeing for the first time the motley crew that had come out to meet the heroes of the Battle of Throm. They had spotted him already, however, and some were deserting the men at the sight of his officer's uniform. Their cries mingled into an insane, whining babble in his ears. Just a scrap for an old man, General. Three children at home, starving. Fought under Jones, Captain. Cigarette? It was a sea of clutching hands, ragged bodies with scrawny arms and bloated stomachs, trembling and writhing in its eagerness to get to him first. Then as one of the temporary officers swung back with a couple of field attendants, it broke apart to let him pass. Its gaze riveted on him as he stumbled between the lines. He spotted a billboard one man was wearing, and his eyes focused sharply on it. Honest Feroya, it announced, credit exchange, best rates in all Cordul. Below that, chalked into a black square, was the important part. 2,345 credits to the dollar. Duke shook his head, but the sign did not change. A quarter million credits for a hundred dollars? And he'd thought, Help a poor old widow? A trembling hand plucked at his sleeve, and he swung to face a woman in worse rags than the others, her eyes dull and unfocused, her lips mouthing the words only by habit. Help the widow of General Dayol? He gasped as he recognized her. Five years before, he'd danced with her at a party given by Dayol danced and agreed that the war was ruining them and that it couldn't get worse. He reached into his pocket before remembering the worthlessness of his bills. But there was half a pack of the wretched cigarettes issued to the men. He tossed them to her and fled, while the other beggars scrambled towards her. He walked woodenly across the leprous field, skirting away from the earth ships toward a collection of tents and tin huts that had swallowed the other veterans. Then he stopped and cursed to himself as a motorcycle sprang into life near the earth freighters and came toward him. Naturally, they'd spotted his hair and skin color. The well-fed, smooth-faced young man swung the machine beside him. Captain O'Neill, he asked, but his voice indicated that he was already certain. Hop in, sir. Director Flannery has been looking forward to meeting you. Duke went steadily on, not varying his steps. The machine paced him uncertainly. Director Flannery of Earth Foreign Office, Captain O'Neill? He requests your presence, he shouted over the purr of his machine. He started to swing ahead of the marching man. Duke kept his eyes on the goal. When his steady steps almost brought him against the cycle, it roared out of his way. He could hear it behind him as he walked, but it faded. There was only the sight and smell of Cordul ahead of him. Section 2 Senators were already filing through the Presidium as Edmonds of South Africa came out of his office with Doherty of the Foreign Office. The youngest senator stopped beside the great bronze doors, studying the situation. Then he sighed in relief. It's all right, he told Doherty. Premier Lassure's presiding. He hadn't been sure the Premier's words were a full promise before, and while he hadn't been too worried, it was good to see that the doubtful Vice Premier would be presiding. It better be all right, the diplomat said. Otherwise, it's my neck. Cathay's counting on Earth to help against the Clumerians, and if Director Flannery ever finds I committed us... Edmonds studied the seats that were filling and nodded with more confidence as he saw that most of the senators on whom he counted were there. I've got enough votes, as I told you, and with Lassure presiding, the opposition won't get far with parliamentary tricks against me. This time, Earth's going to act. Doherty grunted, obviously still worried and headed up the steps to the reserved visitors' gallery while Edmonds moved to his seat in the assembly room. Today he didn't even mind the fact that it was back in the section reserved for the newest members, the unknowns and unimportants from the way the press treated them. He would be neither unknown nor unimportant once his bill was passed, and his brief experience would only add to the miracle he was working. Looking back on his efforts, he found the results something of a miracle to himself. It had taken two years of vote-swapping, of careful propaganda, and of compromise with his principles. 
that business of voting for the combined Throm Meloa aid bill had been a bitter thing. But old Harding was scared sick of antagonizing the aliens by seeming partiality, and Edmund's switch was the step needed to start the softening up. At that, he'd been lucky. In spite of what he'd learned of the manipulation of sociological relationships, in spite of the long preparation in advertising dynamics and effective psychology, he couldn't have made it if Cathay hadn't been a human colony. Now, though, Lesseur was calling the chamber to order. The senators quieted quickly, and there was almost complete silence as the old man picked up the paper before him. The Senate will consider Resolution 1843 today, Lesseur said quietly a resolution that Earth shall grant assistance to the colony of Cathay in the event of any aggressive alien act, proposed by Sir Alfred Edmonds. Since the required time for deliberation has elapsed, the Chair will admit discussion on this resolution. Senator Edmonds. Edmonds was on his feet, and every face turned to him. The spotlight came down on him, blinding him to the others. He picked up the microphone, polishing the words in his mind. The vote might already be decided, but the papers would still print what he said now, and those words could mean his chance to work his way up through the Committee of Foreign Affairs and perhaps on to becoming Earth's youngest premier. It might even mean more, once Earth shook off her lethargy and moved to her rightful position of power and strength among the humanoid worlds, anything could happen. There was the Outer Federation being formed among the frontier worlds and the nucleus of close relations with hundreds of planets. Some day there might be the position of premier of a true interstellar congress. Edmonds began quietly, listening to his voice roll smoothly from the speakers, giving the long history of Earth and her rise to a position as the richest and most respected of planets. He retold the story of how she had been the first to discover the interstellar drive, and how it had inevitably spread. He touched on the envy of alien worlds and the friendship of the humanoid planets that had enabled Earth to found her dozen distant colonies. He couldn't wisely discuss her cowardice and timidity in avoiding her responsibilities to help her friends. But there was another approach. In the forefront of every battle against alien aggression, he declaimed proudly, have been men from Earth. Millions of our young men have fought gloriously and died gladly to protect the human and humanoid civilizations from whatever forms of life have menaced them. Jambula led the forces of Hera against Clovis, just as Captain O'Neill so recently directed the final battle that saved Meloa from the hordes of Throm. In our own ranks, we have a man who spent eight long and perilous years in such a gallant struggle to save a world for humanoid decency, Senator Harding. From the darkened sea of faces a voice suddenly sounded. Will the Senator yield? It was the deep baritone of Harding. Edmonds frowned in irritation, but nodded. A few words of confirmation on his point from Harding couldn't hurt. I yield to the senator from Dixie, he answered. The spotlight shifted as Harding got slowly to his feet, making a white halo of his hair. He did not look at Edmonds, but turned to face Lesueur. Mr. Chairman, he said, I move that Resolution 1843 be tabled. Second! The light shifted to another man. But Edmonds had no time to see who it was as he stood staring open-mouthed at Harding. He shouted for the chair's attention, but Lesseur brought the gavel down sharply once, and his voice rang out over the speakers. It has been moved and seconded that Resolution 1843 be tabled. The senators will now vote. Edmonds stood frozen as the voting began. Then he dropped back hastily to press the button that would turn the square bearing his number a negative red. He saw his light flash on while other squares were lighting. When the voting was finished, there were three such red squares in a nearly solid panel of green. The resolution is tabled, Lesseur announced needlessly. Harding stood up and began moving towards the rear where Edmonds sat. The junior senator was too stunned for thought. Dimly he heard something about regrets and explanations, but the words had no meaning. He felt Harding help him to his feet and begin to guide him toward the door, where someone had already brought a shocked white-faced Daugherty. It was then he thought of Cathay, and what his ambition and Earth's ultimate deceit and cowardice would mean to the millions there. Section 3 A week of the dust-filled air of Miloa had left its mark on Captain Duke O'Neill. It had spread filth over his uniform, added another year to his face, and made walking each morning a dry-throated torture. 
Now he stopped at the entrance to the ship where he had been reassigned a berth for the night shift. An attendant handed him a small bottle, three biscuits and a magazine. He tasted the chemically purified water sickly, stuffed the three ersatz biscuits into his pocket and moved down the ramp, staring at the magazine. It was from Earth, of course, since no printing was being done yet on Miloa. It must have come in on one of the three big Earth freighters he'd heard land during the night. Tucked into it was another of the brief notes he'd been receiving. Director Flannery will be pleased to call on Captain O'Neill at the captain's convenience. He shredded the note as he went across the field. He started to do the same with the news magazine until the headlines caught his attention. Most of the news meant nothing to him, but he skimmed the article on the eleventh planet to join the Outer Federation. The writer was obviously biased against the organization, but Duke nodded approvingly. At least someone was doing something. He saw that Cathay was in for trouble. Earth was living up to her old form. Then he shoved the magazine into his pocket and trudged on towards the veterans' reassignment headquarters. Machinery was being moved from the Earth freighters, and Duke swore again. Five billion Earthmen would read of their generosity to Miloa, and any guilt they felt for their desertion would vanish in a smug satisfaction at their charity. Smugness was easy in a world without dust or carrion smell or craters that had been factories. There were only a few Miloans in the crude tent that served as their headquarters. Duke went back toward the cubbyhole where a thin, haggard man sat on a broken block behind a makeshift desk. The hairless blue head shook slowly while the man's eyes dropped hungrily to the paper in Duke's pocket and away again guiltily. No work, Captain O'Neill, unless you can operate some of those earth machines we're getting. Duke grimaced, passing the magazine over to hands that trembled as they took it. His education was in ultra-literary creative writing, his experience in war. And here, where there was the whole task of rebuilding a planet to be done, the ruin of tools and power made what could be done too little for even the few who were left. There was no grain to reap or wood to cut after the killing gas from Throm had ruined vegetation. There were no workable mines where all had been blasted closed. Transportation was gone, and the economy had passed beyond hand tools, leaving too few of those. Even whole men were idle, and his artificial hand could never replace a real one for carrying rubble. Director Flannery has been asking for you again, the man told him. Duke ignored it. What about my wife? The Miloan frowned, reaching for a soiled scrap of paper. We may have something. One of her former friends thinks she was near this address. We'll send someone out to investigate if you wish, Captain, but it's still pretty uncertain. I'll go myself, Duke said harshly. He picked up the paper, recognizing the location as one that had been in the outskirts. The man behind the desk shook his head doubtfully. Then he shrugged and reached behind him for a small automatic. Better take this, and watch your step. There are two bullets left. Duke nodded his thanks and turned away, dropping the gun into his pocket. Behind him he heard a long sigh and the rustle of a magazine being opened quickly. It was a long walk. At first he traced his way through streets that had been partially blasted clear. After the first mile, however, he was forced to hunt around or over the litter and wreckage, picking the way from high spot to high spot. There were people about, rooting through the debris or patrolling in groups. He drew the automatic and carried it in his hand in plain sight. Some stared at him, and some ignored him, but no one came too close. Once he heard shouting and a group ran across his path chasing a small rodent. He heard a wild tumult begin minutes later. When he passed the spot where they had stopped, a fight was going on, apparently over the kill. At noon he stopped to drink sparingly of his water and eat one of the incredibly bad biscuits. What food there was available, or which could be received from the earth freighters, was being mixed into them. But it wasn't enough. The workers got a little more, and occasionally someone found a few cans under the rubble. The penalty for not turning such food in was revocation of all food allotment. But there was a small black market where unidentified cans could be bought for five earth dollars, and some found its way there. The same black market sold the few remaining cigarettes at twice that amount each. It was beginning to thunder to the north as he stood up and went wearily on, and the haze was thickening. He tried to hurry, uncertain of how dark it would get. If he got caught now, he'd never be able to return before night. He stumbled on a broken street sign, decoding what was left of it, and considered. Then he sighed in relief as he remembered it. He was almost there. The buildings had been lower here, and the rubble was thinner. 
There seemed to be more people about, judging by the traces of smoke that drifted out of holes or through glassless windows. He saw none outside, however. He was considering trying one of the places from which smoke was coming when he saw the little boy five hundred feet ahead. He started forward, but the kid popped into what must have been a cellar once. Duke stopped, calling quietly. This time it was a girl of about sixteen who appeared. She sidled closer, her eyes fixed on his hair, her voice piped out suddenly, scared and desperate. You lonesome, Earth man? Under the fright of it, it was a grotesque attempt at coquetry. She edged nearer, staring at him. I won't roll you honest. All I want is information, he told her thickly. I'm looking for a woman named Rhonda. Rhonda O'Neill. She was my wife. The girl considered, shaking her head. Her eyes grew wider as he pulled out a green earth bill, but she didn't move. Then, as he added the two remaining biscuits, she nodded quickly, motioning him forward. Mom might know, she said. She ran ahead, and soon an older woman shuffled up the broken steps. In her arms was a baby, dead or in a coma, and she rocked it slowly, moaning softly as she listened to his questions. She grunted finally and reached out for the reward. Shuffling ahead of him, she went up the rubble-littered street and around a corner to point. Go in, she said. Rondel be back. Duke shoved the crude door back and stepped into what was left of a foyer in a cheap apartment house. The back had been blasted away, but the falling building had sealed over one corner, covering it from most of the weather. Light came from the shattered window, showing a scrap of blanket laid out on the floor near a few possessions. At first nothing identified the resident in any way, and he wondered if it were a trap. Then he bent over a broken bracelet, and his breath caught sharply. The catch still worked, and a faded miniature of him was inside the little holder. Rhonda's. Duke dropped onto the blanket, trying to imagine what Rhonda would be like and to picture the reunion, but the present circumstances wouldn't fit into anything he could imagine. He could only remember the bravely smiling girl who had seen him off five years before. He heard a babble of voices outside, but he didn't look out. The walk had exhausted him. Hard as the bed was, it was better than standing up. Anyhow, if Rhonda came back, he was pretty sure she would be warned of his presence. He slept fitfully, awakened by the smells and sounds from outside. Once he thought someone looked in, but he couldn't be sure. He turned over, almost decided to investigate, and dozed off again. It was the hoarse sound of breathing and a soft shuffle that wakened him that time. His senses jarred out of a slumber with a feeling of wrongness that reacted in instant caution. He let his eyes slit open, relieved to find there was still light. Between him and the door a figure was creeping up on hands and knees. The rags of clothes indicated it was a woman, and the knife in one hand spelled murder. Duke snapped himself upright to a sitting position, his hand darting for the gun in his pocket. A low shriek came from the woman, and she lunged forward, the knife rising. There was no time for the gun. He caught her wrist, twisting savagely. She scratched and writhed, but the knife spun from her grasp. With a moan she collapsed across his knees. He turned her face up, staring at it unbelievingly. Rhonda. Bloated and stained, lined with fear, it still bore a faint resemblance to the girl he had known. Now a fleeting look of cunning crossed her face briefly, to be replaced with an attempt at dawning recognition. Duke! She gasped it then made a sound that might have been meant for joy. She stumbled to her knees, reaching out to him, but her eyes swiveled briefly towards the knife. Duke, it's you! He pushed her back and reached for the knife. He was sure she'd known who it was, had probably been the one who awakened him by looking in through the broken window. Why'd you try to kill me, Rhonda? You saw who it was. If you needed money, you know I'd give you anything I had. Why? Not for money. She twisted from him and slumped limply against a broken wall. Tears came into her eyes. This time the catch in her voice was real. I know, I, I, I know, Duke. And I wanted to see you, to talk to you, too. She shook her head slowly. What can I do with money? I wanted to wake you up like old times, but Mrs. Kalufa, she led you here. She said... He waited, but she didn't finish. She traced a pattern in the dust on the floor before looking up again. You've never been really hungry. Not that hungry. You wouldn't understand. Even with the dull, you can't starve that much in the time since Cordul was bombed, he protested. He gagged as he thought of the meaning he'd guessed from her words, expecting her to deny it. She shrugged. 
In ten years you can do anything. Oh, sure, you came back on leave and we lived high. Everything was fine here, wasn't it? Sure it was, for you. They briefed me on where I should take you so there'd be good food ready. They kept a few places going for the men who came back on leave. We couldn't ruin your morale." She laughed weakly, and let the sound die away slowly. How do you think we sent out the food and supplies for the fleet the last three years, after the blockade on our supplies from friendly worlds? Why do you think there was no more leave for you? Because they didn't think you brave soldiers could stand just seeing how the rest of us lived. And you think you had it tough. Watch the sky for the enemy while your stomach hopes for the sound that might be a rat. Hide three cans of food you'll be shot for hoarding, because there is nothing else important in the world. And then have a man steal them from you when the raids come. What does a soldier know of war? The sickness inside him grew into a knot, but he still couldn't fully believe what she was saying. But cannibalism? No, she shook her head with a faint trace of his own disgust. No, Duke. Mrs. Kalufa told me, you're not really the same race, not as close as you are to an earth animal, and you don't call that cannibalism. Nobody on Miloa has ever been a cannibal. Yet. How much money do you have, Duke? He took it out and handed it to her. She counted it mechanically and handed it back. Not enough. You can't take me away when you leave here. I'm not leaving, he told her. He dropped the money back on the blanket beside her. She stared at him for a moment and then pulled herself up to her feet, moving toward the door. Goodbye, Duke, and get off me, Loa. You can't help us any more, and I don't want you here when I get desperate enough to remember you might take me back. I like you too much for that, even now. He took a step toward her, and she ducked. Get out, she screamed it at him. Do you think I can stand looking at you without drooling any longer? Do you want me to call Mrs. Kalufa for help? Through the open door he saw Mrs. Kalufa across the street still cradling the child. As the door slammed shut behind him, the woman screamed, either as a summons or from fear that he'd seek revenge on her. He saw other heads appear with frantic eyes that stared sullenly at the gun he carried. He stumbled down the street where rain was beginning to fall, conscious that it would be night before he got back to the port. He no longer cared. There was no place for him here, he now saw. He was still an Earthman, and Earthmen were always treated as a race apart somehow. He didn't belong, nor could he go back to a life on Earth. But there were still the recruiting stations there. So long as war existed, there had to be such stations. He headed for the fat ships of Earth that squatted complacently on the wrecked port. Section 4 Prince Queeth of Shugfarth had left the royal belt behind, and only a plain band encircled his round little body as he trotted along, his four legs making almost no sound. His double pair of thin arms and the bird-like head on his long neck bobbled excitedly in time to his steps. Once he stopped to glance across the black stone buildings of the city as they shone in the dull red of the sun, toward the hill where his father's palace was lighted brightly for the benefit of his earth guests. Queef touched his ears together ceremoniously, and then trotted on until he came to the back door of his group's gymnasium. He whistled the code word, and the door opened automatically. The whole group was assembled, though it was past sleep week for most of them. Their ears clicked together, but they waited silently as he curled himself up in the official box. Then Kral, the merchant viscount, whistled questioningly. This will have to be important, Queef. The prince bobbed his ears emphatically. It is. My father's guests have all the news, and I learned everything. It won't be as long as we thought. He paused before delivering the big news. The bipeds of Clumeria are going to attack Cathay. There'll be official war there within two weeks. He saw them exchange hasty signals, but again it was Kral who voiced their question. And do you think that is important, Queef? What does it offer us? Cathay is a human colony. Earth will have to declare war with her and with Earth's wealth it will be over before we could arrive. Earth has already passed a resolution that neutrality will apply to colonies as well as to other planets. This time the whistles were sharper. Kral had difficulty believing it at first. So Earth really is afraid to fight? That must mean those rumors that she has no fleet are true. Our ancestors thought so, and even planned to attack her before the humanoids defeated us. The Ancestor King believed that even a single ship fully armed might conquer her. It could be, Queeth admitted. But do you agree that this is the news for which we've waited so long? 
There was a quick flutter of cars. It's our duty, Kral agreed. In a war between Cathay and Clumeria, we can't remain neutral if we're ever to serve our friends. Well, the ship is ready. That came as a surprise to Queeth. He knew the plans were well along, but not that they were completed. As merchant viscount and second-degree adult, Kral was entitled to a tenth of his father's interests. He'd chosen the biggest freighter and the balance in fluid assets to the pleasure of his father, who believed he was planning an honorable career of exploring. The conversion completed, Queeth asked, but the planet bombs. Earth supplied them on the last shipment. I explained on the order that I was going to search uninhabited planets for minerals. Queeth counted the group again and was satisfied. There were enough. With a ship of that size fully staffed and armed, they would be a welcome addition to any fleet. They might be enough to tip the balance for victory, in fact. And while Cathay and Clumeria lay a long way on the other side of Earth's system, the drives were fast enough to cover it in two weeks. "'Does your father know?' Kral asked. Queeth smirked. "'Would you tell him? He still believes, along with the Earth Ambassador, that the warrior strain was ruined among our people when we lost the war with the humanoids.' "'Maybe it was,' Kral said doubtfully. In four generations it could evolve again, and there are the books and traditions from which we trained. If even a timid race such as those of Earth can produce warriors like O'Neill, a, a mere poet, why can't the Shugfarth do better, particularly when Earth rebuilt factories for us to start our shipbuilding anew? Then we join the war, the prince decided. There was a series of assent signals from the group. Tonight, he suggested, and again there was only assent. Kral stood up, setting the course for the others. When the last had risen, Queeth uncurled himself and rose from the box. We'll have to pass near Earth, he suggested as they filed out towards the hangars where Kral kept his ship. Maybe we should show our intentions there. There was a sudden whistle of surprise. Then the ascent was mounting wildly. Queeth trotted ahead toward the warship, making his attack plans over again as he realized he was a born leader who could command such enthusiasm. He had been doubtful before, in spite of his study of elementary statistical treatment of relationships. The lights in the palace showed that the Earth guests were still celebrating as the great heavily laden warship blasted up and headed towards Earth. Section 5 Duke O'Neill found a corner of the lounge where no Earthman was near and dropped down with the magazines and papers, trying to catch up on the currents of the universe as they affected the six hundred connected worlds. Most of the articles related to Earth alone, and he skipped them. He found one on the setup of the Outer Federation, finally. The humanoid planets there were in a pocket of alien worlds, and Union had been almost automatic. It was still loose, but it seemed to have sound enough basis. If Earth had been willing to come out of its shell and risk some of its fat trading profits, there could have been an even stronger Union that would have driven warlike thoughts out of the minds of all the aliens. Instead, she seemed to be equally interested in building up her potential enemies and ruining her friends. Duke had watched a showing of new films on the work being done on Throm the night before, and he was still sick from it. Throm had lost the war, but by a military defeat, not by thirty-one unprotected raids on all her surface. She still had landing fields equipped for Earth's ships, and the big freighters were dropping down regularly, spewing out foods, equipment, and even heavy machinery for her rebuilding. Throm was already on the road back. Miloa had to wait until she could pull herself up enough to build fields. Duke turned his eyes to the port. The ship had stopped at Clovis on the way back to Earth. From where he sat, he could see almost Earth-like skyscrapers stretching up in a great city. The landing field was huge, and there were rows on rows of factories building more of the freighters that stubbed the field. It seemed impossible when he remembered that only forty years had passed since Jambula's suicide raid had finally defeated the fungoid creatures of the planet, and since the survivors vows to repay all Earthmen for the defeat. They were a prolific race, of course, but without help from Earth the factories would be shacks, and the rockets and high-drive ships would be only memories. He wondered how many were cursing their ancestors for making the mistake of attacking a neighboring humanoid planet instead of Earth, only two days away on high-drive. By now they knew that Earth was defenseless, and yet they seemed content to go on with their vows forgotten. Duke couldn't believe it. Down underground, beyond Earth inspection, they could have vast stockpiles of weapons ready to install in their ships within days. How could Earth risk it, unless she had her own stock of hidden ships and weapons? Yet, if she did, he was sure that it would have been impossible not to use them in defense of the colony of Cathay. 
He started out, watching the crewmen mixing with the repulsive alien natives, laughing as they worked side by side. There must be some factor he didn't understand, but he'd never found it, nor did he know anyone who had guessed it. He stirred, uncomfortable with his own thoughts, but it wasn't fear for Earth that bothered him. It was simply that sooner or later some alien race would risk whatever unknown power the others feared. If the aliens won, the vast potential power of Earth would then be turned against all the humanoid races of the universe. Humanity could be driven from the galaxy. He turned the pages, idly glancing at the headlines. It was hard to realize that the paper wasn't right off the presses of Earth. It must have been brought out to Clovis on the latest ship. He checked the date and frowned in surprise. According to the rough calendar he'd kept, it was the current date. Somewhere he must have lost track of two days. How much else had he lost sight of during the long years of war? A diagram caught his attention almost at once as he turned to another magazine. It was of a behemoth ship, bigger than any he'd ever seen, and built like the dream of a battleship, though it was listed as a freighter. He scanned it, mentally converting it. With a few like that, Miloa could have won during the first year. Then he swore, as he saw it, was part of an article on the progress of some alien world known as Shugfarth. By the article, a world of former warriors once dedicated to the complete elimination of humanoids. He saw Flannery coming along the deck at that moment, and he picked up the magazine heading for his cabin. He'd ignored previous summonses on the thin excuse of not feeling well. He had no desire to talk with Earthmen. It was bad enough to take their charity back to Earth and to have to stay on the planet until he could sign on with the Outer Federation. His memories were ugly enough, without having them refreshed. But Flannery caught him as he was opening the door to his cabin. The director was huge, with heavy, strong features and a body that looked too robust for the white hair and the age that showed around his eyes. His voice was tired, however, showing his years more plainly than his looks. Captain O'Neill, he said quickly. Stop jousting with windmills. It's time you grew up. Besides, I've got a job for you. Does my charity passage demand an interview, Director? Duke asked. The other showed no offense, unfortunately. He smiled wryly. If I choose, it does. I'm in command of this ship, as well as head of the foreign office. May I come in? I can't keep you out, Duke admitted. He dropped onto the couch, sprawling out, while the other found the single chair. Flannery picked up the magazine and glanced through it. So you're interested in the Outer Federation, he asked. Don't be. It doesn't have a chance. In a week or so you'll see it shot. And I don't mean we'll wreck it. They've picked their own doom against all the advice we could give them. Care to have a drink sent down while we talk? Duke shook his head. I'd rather cut it short. Hotheads, Flannery told the walls thoughtfully, make the best men obtainable once they're tamed. Nothing beats an idealist who can face facts, and the intelligent ones usually grow up. Captain, I've studied your strategy against Throm on that last drive after Dale was killed. Brilliant. I need a good man, and I can pay for one. If you give me a chance, I can also show you why you should take it. Know anything about how Earth got started on its present course? Dumb luck and cowardice, as far as I can see, Duke answered. When Earth discovered the first inefficient version of the High Drive, she had found herself in a deserted section of the universe, with the nearest inhabited star system months away. The secret of the drive couldn't be kept, of course, but the races who used it to build war fleets found it easier to fight with each other than with distant Earth. Later, when faster drives were developed, Earth was protected by the buffer worlds she had rebuilt. Flannery grinned. Luck and experience. We learned something from our early nuclear technological wars. We learned more from the interstellar wars of others. We decided that any planet ruined by such war wouldn't fight again. The women and children who lived through that hell would see to it, unless new hatreds grew up during the struggle back. So we practically pauperized ourselves at first to see that they recovered too quickly for hate and fear. We also began digging into the science of how to manipulate relationships. Earth's greatest discovery to set up a system that would work. It paid off for us in the long run. So what's all that got to do with me? Duke asked. He'd heard of the great science of Earth and her ability to manipulate all kinds of relationships before, spoken of in hush-hush terms when he was still in college. But he'd quit believing in fairy tales even before then. Now he was even sicker of Earth's self-justification. <laughs>
Flannery frowned and then shrugged. It's no secret I need a good man on Throm, and you're the logical candidate if I can pound some facts into your head. I've found that sending an Earthman they know as a competent enemy works wonders. Not at first. There's hostility for a while. But in the long run, it gives them a new slant on us." "'Then you'd better get an Earthman,' Duke snapped. You're talking to a citizen of Meloa by choice." "'I hadn't finished my explanation,' Flannery reminded. Duke snorted. "'I was brought up on explanations. I heard men spouting about taming the aliens when I first learned to talk, as if they were wild animals. I read articles on how the Clovism and those things from Shugfarth needed kindness. It's the same guff I heard about how to handle lions, but the men doing the talking weren't in the ring. And I noticed the ringmaster carried a whip and a gun. He knew the beasts. I know the aliens of Throm. From fighting them? From hating them? Or from being more afraid of them than you think Earth is, Captain? I've talked to more aliens than you've ever seen. And the Roman diplomats laughed at the soldiers who told them the Goths were getting ready to sack Rome. Flannery stared at him in sudden amusement. We aren't in an empire period, O'Neill. But you might look up what the Romans did to conquered people during the Republic, when Rome was still growing. Captain, I'm not underrating the aliens. Tame aliens, or once faking tameness, you've seen them smiling. Maybe I saw the other side. The old man sighed heavily and reached for his shirt. He began unbuttoning it and pulling it over his head. You've got a nice prosthetic hand, he said. Now take a look at some real handiwork. There was a strap affair around his shoulders with a set of complicated electronic controls slipped into the muscle fibers. From them both arms hung loose, unattached at the shoulder blades. Further down a another affair of webbing went around his waist. Only one leg is false, he explained, but the decorations are real. They came from a highly skilled torturer. I've had my experience with aliens. Clovisum, if you're curious. I was second in command on Jambula's volunteer raid forty years ago." Duke dropped his eyes from the scars. For a second he groped for words of apology. Then the cold, frozen section of his brain swallowed the emotions. "'I've seen a woman with a prosthetic soul,' he said bitterly. Only she didn't turn yellow because of what the aliens did." Red spots shot into Flannery's cheeks, and one of the artificial arms jerked back as savagely as a real one. He hesitated, then reached for his shirt. Okay, squaw man. The word had no meaning for Duke, though he knew it was an insult. But he couldn't respond to it. He fumbled through his memories, trying to place it. Something about Indians. Flannery began buttoning his pants over the shirt. I'm out of bounds, Captain, he said more quietly. I hope you don't know the prejudices behind that crack. But you win. If you ever want the rest of the explanation, look me up. He closed the door behind him softly and went striding evenly up the passage. Duke frowned after him. The talk had gotten under his skin. If there were things he didn't know... Then he swore at himself. There was plenty he didn't know. But the carefully developed indoctrination propaganda of the top Earth psychologist wasn't the answer he wanted. He'd have to make his stay on Earth shorter than he'd planned. If they could get to a man who had served under Jambula and convince him that Clovisim were nice house pets, it was little wonder they could wrap the rest of the earth around their psychological fingers. Too bad their psychology wasn't adjusted to aliens. End of Part 1 of Victory by Lester Del Rey